Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for coming and joining us for another talk this afternoon. Um, feel free to text questions into the, the uh, Q&A box so that we can ask Dr. Buss some questions as soon as he's done talking. Our next speaker is Dr. David Buss, and he will be introduced by our very own Karen, Dr. Karen Perilou, an Associate Professor of Psychology here at Southwestern. Thanks. I am honored to introduce our next speaker, Dr. David M. Buss. Dr. Buss is a professor of psychology at the University of Texas at Austin and previously taught at Harvard University and the University of Michigan. He's the foremost expert on the evolutionary approach to human mating, a journey which got a real kickstart in 1989 when he and four like-minded scientists received a major award through Stanford to spend a year establishing what would become evolutionary psychology. This trailblazing field is intensely interdisciplinary, mixing psychology, biology, anthropology, medicine, zoology, and other topics into a perspective on our species that transcends subfields. Two years ago, Dr. Buss was cited as one of the 50 most influential living psychologists in the world. As someone whose academic life he greatly influenced, I fully corroborate this. 18 years ago, I could not believe someone as prestigious as David Buss would deign to give me a spot in his graduate lab, but he took a chance on me and I got to witness his genius and prolific research firsthand. Dr. Buss is always pushing our field forward and leading by example. He was there at the forefront, along with a whole host of evolutionarily minded geniuses at the University of Michigan. He not only helped establish our field's international organization, the Human Behavior and Evolution Society, he also served as its president from 2005 to 2007 and received its Lifetime Achievement Award in 2018. Dr. Buss has led the field with over 300 publications and numerous books, such as The Evolution of Desire, which is required reading for my capstone, A Dangerous Passion, The Murderer Next Door, and his most recent book, When Men Behave Badly, a topic into which he will be giving us a glimpse right now. So with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. David Buss. Hello, uh, let me just do the share screen. Um, all right, okay, is that um, all good? Well, thank you. Karen for that lovely introduction and I'd also like to um, thank the organizers of the conference Faye and Ben for organizing really a terrific symposium I've really enjoyed all the talks uh, so far and um, mine actually naturally follows on some of them in particular Mike Ryan's talk this morning where he explained the logic of sexual selection theory and some background associated with that uh, which means that I don't have to go into any detail about sexual selection theory, since I hope everyone in the uh, listening audience out there um, uh, heard his talk and uh, listened to his, the wonderful insights that he had. So um, this talk is based on um, actually uh, two books, one that both of which Karen mentioned uh, kindly, The Evolution of Desire, Strategies of Human Mating, which is a broader book that deals with the really fascinating menu of mating strategies that humans have from uh, long-term pair bonded mating, short-term mating, uh, infidelity, serial mating, multiple mating, polyandry, uh, et cetera, uh, and deals with what strategies people use in attracting mates, selecting mates, keeping mates, uh, getting rid of bad mates uh, and then entering the mating market anew. My most recent book, uh, which is gonna be mainly the focus of the talk today is called When Men Behave Badly, The Hidden Roots of Sexual Deception, Harassment and Assault. And this is really a culmination of uh, many, many years of research that I've been doing on the topic of conflict between the sexes. Why do men and women seem to be at odds with each other in various domains? And why do we have recurrent conflicts? Uh, can an evolutionary perspective shed light on these conflicts and how to reduce sexual conflict? And that's really what my goal is. And, and I think that um, you know, well, you will be the judge of whether 
this perspective can help us to reduce sexual conflict. But we have to go into the nitty gritty details of where these conflicts occur uh, and in order to have any hope of reducing them. So um, the first point that I'd like to make is that there are sex differences. Um, you know, if you look at just even the most recent high profile cases of serial sexual harassers or sexual predators, uh, there aren't any women. And, and it's, it's almost like a, a fish swimming in, in water where we kind of take it for granted. But, but I think it's an important empirical fact that the serial sexual harassers and sexual predators are almost exclusively um, men. Uh, and, and so we have to ask why. And when it comes to sexual violence, um, when sometimes people think about it in a very narrow sense, but I think if you look at the topic of sexual violence, there's really a staggering array of different types of sexual violence. So uh, at, ranging from say unwanted sexual attention, uh, non-consensual touching, groping or kissing, and these, this can occur uh, in bars, it can occur in Con at concerts or any, any group events uh, can occur, of course, in the workplace. Uh, and when it does, we have, uh, it, it's often called sexual harassment, topic I'm gonna get into in a little bit of detail. There's sexual deception. Um, we know that this occurs in um, online dating, for example, where there's sexual deception on uh, both sexes part. Uh, but if uh, those of you who saw the recent Netflix show, The Tinder Swindler, uh, internet dating has opened up opportunities for sexual predators and sexual harassers and stalkers uh, that we, were not formally available. And so I'm going to get into that a little bit as well, mismatches between ancestral and modern environments when it comes to uh, the modern technology that we have available that's relatively recent. Uh, intimate partner violence uh, is a big problem associated with mate guarding, stalking, uh, stalking, almost all stalking is mating related, and it's often the, the largest category is intimate partners who have been dumped, who have been rejected, and who stalk their, their former partner, uh, either with, uh, often with the goal of trying to prevent her from remating, uh, uh, or trying to lure her back into a relationship with him, um, and sometimes both. It's what I call triangular sexual conflict when you have a third, a third party there. Another novel form of sexual conflict is revenge porn, where um, there are sexually explicit photographs taken um, uh, of, of a partner and then there's a breakup. And there are sites now where people post, um, you know, as a, as a way of uh, these sexually explicit photographs or sometimes videos as a way of, of getting back at their partner, seeking revenge. Um, stranger rape, acquaintance rape, spousal or partner rape, um, honor killings, sex trafficking. The key point that I wanna make is that sexu sexual violence is not a very, it's not a narrow topic. It doesn't just deal with one thing. There's a whole array of different types of sexual uh, violence that we need to confront. Uh, how prevalent are women victims? Well, studies give differing rates. As, as you probably know, depending on the, the sample, the methodology that's used, et cetera. And so these figures should not be taken as um, written in stone. They're just rough estimates. Um, so sexual harassment, uh, so studies put it around 59% of women will be sexually harassed at some point in their life. Uh, I, I pulled this stat from Canada because Canada is uh, on intimate partner violence because Canada is often viewed as, you know, a more peaceful, less violent culture. And it is in many respects, say compared to the United States, uh, to, the, to the South. But even in Canada, 27% of women will experience intimate partner violence at some point during their lifetime. Uh, stalking victims, some studies put it at around 19% for high school students. Rape rates, uh, again, depending on methodology, uh, the, the definition that's used, the sample, et cetera. There's a whole range. Uh, most put it somewhere between 17 and 23%. We also know that uh, these are often corrected for underreporting because rape, of course, is one of the most underreported uh, crimes, period. 
Um, and, and there are good reasons for, for that, which, which we may get into. There haven't been, revenge porn is sufficiently novel, that there haven't been many studies on it, but there's one study from, recent study from Australia that put the uh, rates at around 10%, that is 10% of women have experienced revenge porn after a breakup. Now, there are many harms to sexual violence and um, the, uh, your introducer, Dr. Karen Perilou, um, uh, spearheaded a study that we did here at the University of Texas with uh, Josh Duntley, published um, uh, a while back, where we, where we compared, we, we looked at uh, victims of rape, victims of attempted rape, and then women who reported neither rape nor attempted rape, and we found uh, and this coincides with a large body of evidence sh suggesting that, um, that this form of sexual violence leads to depression, damage to their self-esteem of victims, anxiety, eating disorders, PTSD. I'm gonna come back to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, a bit later in the talk. Uh, it impairs work and school impairment, uh, it impairs work and school, social life, and also increases suicidal ideation. So it's very, very, very harmful to victims. Um, and there's another dimension that most people don't consider when they think about sexual violence, and that is the harms to secondary victims. So that is, the, it's not just these individual women who are experiencing this, They're, they have friends, they have work colleagues who care about them, male friends, they have romantic partners sometimes, family members, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, um, daughters. Uh, and then also another group which is rarely considered is that the women who are not primary victims, but who are forced to live in fear of sexual violence when it occurs to others, but also just um, restricting their freedom of movement, uh, devoting effort, energy, and attention to preventing becoming a victim. And that is time, energy, and attention that can't be, you know, time, energy, attention. These are limited, valuable resources, and that's time, atten attention, and energy that cannot be used to solve other adaptive problems or devote to other, other things like, like work or relationships or, or family networks and so forth. So, um, so the key point is that from an evolutionary perspective, I want to argue that sexual violence is the most widespread human rights problem in the world. And when we think about human rights, we often think, at least in the United States, we think about freedom of speech. We think about freedom of the press. We think about freedom of religion. Um, but I think that the freedom to decide um, to choose when, where, with whom, and in which circumstances one engages in sexual activity should be a universal human right. And that's why I think that if you just consider worldwide, 50% of the, of the population are women. And then if you consider also all of the secondary victims of sexual violence, uh, you're talking about a lot of people uh, who, who uh, are having their rights, their freedom of choice interfered with in multiple ways uh, by, by other people, primar primarily by men, not exclusively. So of course, sexual choice, as Mike Ryan pointed out this morning, uh, is critical to Darwin's theory of sexual selection. And Darwin, as Mike Ryan noted, uh, was troubled by phenomena that could not be explained by natural selection or so-called survival selection. And so he developed what has now become the dominant theory, uh, the dominant theoretical framework to understanding the mating strategies of sexually reproducing species. And the two components uh, are preferential mate choice. Uh, and as Mike Ryan also noted, um, in Many species, it's the females who do the choosing, males who do the competing with each other for access to the valuable females. But in our species, it's different. As I alluded to, this complex menu of mating strategies include things like long-term pair-bonded mating, 
And so what we have is more accurately described as a mating system of mutual mate choice, where both men and women do the selecting and men and women compete with each other, compete with members of their own sex for access to members of the desirable sex. So, so I don't have to spend any more time on the theory of sexual selection, but it's a very important overarching theoretical framework to understand this. And I uh, believe that when you talk about the mating strategies of humans, that female choice is indeed one of the most important, it's like a, a law of mating. Uh, and um, so enough about that. So uh, understanding the causes, context, and psychology of perpetrators and victims, I think I'm gonna argue can help create cures. Can an evolutionary perspective help us to do this? And I believe it can, and you, you'll be the judge of that uh, by the end of this talk. Uh, now, to delve into this, I have to define what sexual conflict is and give some examples. Uh, but just to say that it's, it's, it's evolutionarily ancient. So life on Earth started about three, three and a half billion years ago. But sexual reproduction is more relatively more recent, but still very ancient. Estimates vary between about 1.2 billion to 2 billion years ago, where you had the evolution of sexual as opposed to asexual reproduction. And, uh, and so uh, what you, and once you have two sexes, and sex is being defined as the size of the gametes. So um, as Mike Ryan noted, uh, females uh, are the ones with the large nutrient rich eggs in the human case. Males defined as the small gametes uh, in the human case um, sperm. Now, um, once you have, so, so, so I'm gonna give a couple kind of analogies. The first analogy that I wanna use is, is uh, an analogy with coevolutionary arms races between different species. And we know these occur, for example, with parasites and hosts. Um, they're occurring during the pandemic uh, uh, as we speak. Uh, new variants of, uh, uh, of COVID are, are evolving and we are furiously trying to create, cult in this case, cultural defenses to combat these, uh, these viruses. But uh, another one is, is a predator is in prey, and it's very easy to see. And so this is an example of a cheetah. A cheetahs are, are predators, and impalas are some of their prey. And there's an intrinsic conflict between predators and prey. Uh, so as you can see from the graph, the fitness peak, and I mean that in that evolutionary sense of fitness, meaning you can think about it as a shorthand of reproductive success, the, the cheetah's peak is very different from the impala's peak. Cheetah's peak is to get every impala that he wants for, uh, he or she wants for dinner. The impala's peak is to survive, uh, to live another day and to mate and reproduce. But there's an inherent conflict between these predators and prey. And so what you have is a coevolutionary arms race where uh, for each increment in the speed and agility of the cheetah, that selects for increments in speed and agility of impalas. And so we're such that the, the weaker, the uh, slower, the less fleet of foot impalas get eaten for dinner. And similarly, the slower, less fleet of foot cheetahs uh, starve to death because they, they can't get their, their dinner. Uh, and so we see adaptations, but importantly, co-evolutionary arms races between species. Now, what I'm gonna argue is that a similar logic occurs between males and females within species, known as sexual conflict. Now, sexual conflict has become a huge area within evolutionary biology, where there are entire books written about them, uh, uh, almost none dealing with humans. Uh, but uh, for example, Arnqvist and Rowe published a, a really classic book in 2005 on sexual conflict, where they talked about spiders and uh, you know, birds and an astonishing variety of species where sexual conflict occurs. So I'll just give one example here. So I'm gonna focus mostly on humans, but uh, this is an example where male spiders give females gifts of prey and females don't wanna mate with the males unless they get this gift. But what the males do is they wrap the gift in silk. And the reason that they do that 
biologists think is because if they just give the gift, sometimes the female just takes the gifts and says, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm gonna go have dinner alone uh, without copulating. And so males have evolved to wrap this gift in silk and that prevents the female from stealing without copulating. But sometimes the male deceives the female by wrapping a piece of trash in the silk. Um, and so she has to unwrap it to figure out, hey, well, this, this is not really a gift. Now, uh, females have evolved other adaptations to try to detect whether it is actually just a piece of trash or a nuptial gift. Uh, and then, you know, and then males sometimes try to disguise a piece of trash with leftovers from a, a previous dinner. Okay, the point is that there's this, this inherent conflict between males and females um, that occurs and it's a co-evolutionary arms race and the spiders in modern times are end results of that co-evolutionary arms race. Uh, now here's another way of thinking about sexual conflict. And that is that, that this is hypothetical, but it's I think realistic. Let's consider time elapsed. You're a human and you meet someone and how much time would you prefer to elapse before you have sex with this person? Let's assume you're, you're attracted to the person. Well, let's assume that there's a difference between the male optimum from an evolutionary perspective and the female optimum from an evolutionary perspective. Well, if there are sex differences in optima, then this will create a zone of conflict, a region where males will evolve adaptations to influence or manipulate females to be closer to their optimum. And also women will evolve defenses to prevent being manipulated uh, to be closer to the male optimum. And so there will be this tug of war or co-evolutionary arms races uh, that will occur in these zones of conflict. Uh, amount of investment before sex, same thing. There's, it could be a zone of conflict between the sexes. Uh, here's another one, mate value discrepancies. So let's assume in this case, uh, and, and there are good reasons for putting the male and females in these um, spots, Let's say the male is a six using the crude American, you know, how hot are you or how desirable you are. Let's assume the male is a six and the female is an eight. Uh, well, from a female's perspective, this guy is too low in mate value. From the guy's perspective, he would like to mate with this higher mate value female and may not accurately perceive his own mate value. And in fact, there's evidence that men tend to on average overestimate their attractiveness to women. And so men are more likely to think that they are eights when they're not. They think they're hot, but they're not. But anyway, at any rate, this perceived mate value discrepancy will create a zone of conflict that will occur between the sexes. So, and here's another way of thinking about the sexually antagonistic co-evolution within species. Let's say that you have an adaptation uh, for male sexual persistence. That is, you know, uh, not hearing the word no, uh, persisting, even if there are no cues there. Well, if that, if that male sexual persistence um, causes the woman to mate with a, a suboptimal male or to mate sooner than she would prefer or at a non-optimal or non-propitious time or a set of circumstances, then that will result in a decline in her fitness or reproductive success, which will in turn select for female sexual resistance adaptations, defenses to prevent being manipulated by the male into sex when it is not propitious for her to do so. Um, and that will result in a decline in the male fitness, that is the fitness of the males who are pursuing a sexually persistent strategy. And so this co-evolutionary um, arms race will continue uh, either for more persistence and more resistance or ways to circumvent the female defense adaptations that occur. So now I'm gonna talk about, uh, just very briefly about sex differences in human reproductive biology. Uh, and as noted, women are the more valuable uh, sex from a reproductive standpoint. Um, now, this is a generalization that is inherent in our reproductive biology, but can be compensated for in the context of long-term pair bonded mating, where both males and females uh, can be highly desirable, high investing, 
uh, and very valuable to each other. But when you start with reproductive biology, it starts with a sperm and egg, but does not end there. So we have uh, internal female fertilization. Uh, so that is, a, that, and this isn't a biological law of nature because in some species fertilization occurs uh, in the male as Mike Ryan illustrated with the, the uh, pipefish seahorse, for example. Uh, and some species where fertilization occurs externally to both sexes, but in our species and in all species of primates, of which we are one, all species of mammals, of which we are one, uh, fertilization occurs internally within the female. Uh, this creates problems for males of paternity uncertainty, and that's why long-term mating is, is so, it's one of the reasons why long-term pair bond and mating is so rare, only occurs in uh, somewhere between three and five percent of mammalian species, uh, because men have, males have to solve this problem of paternity uncertainty in order to devote their resources. Uh, result in misdirected parental investment if the man is, uh, or the male is investing uh, a couple of decades of resources in an offspring in the mistaken belief that it is his when it is in fact the male man's or the next door neighbor's. Uh, this parental investment is obligatory. So uh, in the human case, it's roughly nine months. So women can't say, look, I'm very busy with my career right now. I only want to put in two and a half months. It's just part of our reproductive biology. And it's a massive, it's a massive form of investment. It's metabolically expensive, uh, uh, restricts uh, female uh, movement, especially in the latter stages of pregnancy. Uh, and um, uh, and so forth. And so, so this is huge. Functional mammary glands, females have them, males do not. Body fat distribution differs in males and females. Uh, and I don't have to go into detail on that, but uh, once males and females hit puberty, the body fat distribution um, changes dramatically between the sexes. Um, concealed ovulation, I should say that's relatively concealed ovulation. Humans have often been viewed as a species where compared to uh, our closest primate relatives uh, or cousins, the chimpanzees, where ovulation is a very, uh, very visible phenomenon. And so female uh, chimps, for example, have these large red genital swellings. Maybe you've seen them in, in documentaries and uh, nature shows. Uh, and the males kind of go into a, a sexual frenzy during that estrus phase uh, in chimps, but we don't have anything like that. I, I, one quick anecdote, I had a graduate student once, this is back when I was teaching at the University of Michigan, who claimed that he could detect, he could walk into a bar and detect, oh, she's ovulating, she's not, she's ovulating. But it turned out his, his um, boasts about his detection abilities were part of a pattern of uh, lying about a lot of things, and so we ended up kicking him out of the graduate program. Um, there's some evidence that there are several changes uh, that females do undergo, uh, non-contracepting females when they ovulate, uh, and under some subtle circumstances, males might be able to detect them, but the evidence is still out, and some of the larger scale studies have failed to replicate uh, those uh, detection results. So at any rate, whether it's concealed, concealed totally or relatively concealed, it's still relatively concealed and it's uh, cyclical. So uh, roughly 28, every 28 days or so, a woman ovulates, uh, if she's not on contraception, on hormonal contraception, she ovulates one of those uh, valuable eggs. And then fertility curves, of course, differ dramatically between the sexes uh, over the lifespan. And so this is just an, a, one curve to illustrate that. And as you can see, uh, both males and females after uh, puberty, uh, after uh, a period called uh, post-adolescent, uh, I can't remember exact, the exact phrasing, but uh, women don't just like hit puberty and all of a sudden they're fertile. There's this period of uh, adolescent subfertility where cycles uh, aren't regular and so their fertility is a bit lower than it hits a bit later on. But at any rate, there's a pretty dramatic age curve difference over the lifespan in fertility between males and, and females. And these are important facts. and um, to an evolutionist and to an evolutionary psychologist, it would defy logic and, and if there were not also 
psychological, strategic, and behavioral sex differences that have evolved to deal with the different adaptive problems males and females have faced as a consequence of their different reproductive biology. Um, it's just like, it's like bipedal locomotion. Uh, it would be like saying we have the, the musculature and anatomy for bipedal locomotion, but we don't walk. Um, you know, it's whenever you see these um, anatomical, physiological uh, uh, sex differences, you see psychological, behavioral, and strategic sex differences that have co-evolved along with them. Um, now, sexual conflict occurs in three temporal contexts. Before mating, uh, as I call it, on the, on the mating market, uh, after a mateship has formed, uh, you think, well, boy, I've gone to the trouble of selecting a mate, attracting a mate, now we're finally together, I can rest easy. Well, no, you can't. Uh, we know that divorce rates uh, hover now between 40 and 50%. Breakup rates um, of non-married couples are all, also very common. Uh, in the United States, 85% of people will experience at least one romantic breakup uh, and, and often more than one. Um, and, then, uh, and then even after you've broken up, uh, the conflicts don't end because of uh, stalking, for example, as I mentioned, and revenge porn and other forms of conflict that occur even post-mating. Now, I'm not going to be able, given the time constraints, to get into all these, but my new book, When Men Behave Badly, uh, is focused on this, has chapters devoted to these different phases of the mating game and also how, uh, what strategies people use to cope with these conflicts at these different phases. Uh, so, evolved sex differences that produce sexual conflict. Well, what, what are they? One of the most important is a sex difference in desire for sexual variety. And what I mean by that is a variety of de desire for a variety of different sex partners. And so this, there's just a ton, there's an avalanche, or as my colleague David Schmidt says, a mountain of evidence suggesting that the, there are sex differences in this. And, these are, as many of you know, they're um, in psychology and, and in, in sciences generally, there's what's called the replication crisis, where you get a psychological effect and then when on closer scrutiny, it turns out others can't replicate it, or they're small in magnitude. These are not. These are highly replicable across cultures and they are large in magnitude. They are not trivial sex differences. And I'll give a couple of examples of that just to bring the point home. Time elapsed for seeking sexual intercourse, sexual fantasies, male and female sexual fantasies differ on average um, with males. And, and, and the on average is very important. And, and, and I wanna just emphasize that when I say on average, um, what I mean is that the psychological, behavioral and strategic sex differences, there's overlap in the distribution. So this is not men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Uh, so there's overlap in the distribution, but these are on average mean level differences between the sexes, but that are pretty hefty in magnitude. These aren't, these aren't trivial. They're in fact, in many cases, greater than, for example, the sex differences in height, um, which we know are, are there tall female, females taller than males and so forth, but on average men are a bit taller than females by about five, six inches. Um, Males do more uh, partner switching during the course of a single fantasy episode. For example, women are more likely to fantasize uh, about a single partner. A uh, patron of prostitutes is almost exclusively a male uh, patronage um, event, 99% plus. Um, huge sex difference there. Uh, can men and women be just friends? Well, research um, that I did with a former graduate student, uh, uh, April Blesky, April, April Blesky Rechek, Rechek, uh suggests that, well, the answer to this question as a Harry Met Sally, when Harry Met Sally posed the question, turns out it depends on whether you're a man or a woman. Men have more difficulty being just friends. Um, and part of the reason for that is that men tend to become on average more attracted sexually or romantically to their opposite sex friend. And when that attraction is not reciprocated, then uh, it causes conflict in the relationship and sometimes a breakup uh, of that friendship, that cross-sex friendship. 
Here's one of my favorites, not, not my favorite finding, kind of a terrible finding, but would you, could you enjoy having sex with someone that you found attractive, it, who you really hated, you really disliked this person? And men said, men, men said well, she's attractive, yeah, I, I could have sex with her, whereas women, it's, it's a deal killer, it's a deal breaker. So um, just so that you think I'm not talking out of my hat about these things, just a couple of graphs. Uh, this is, uh, would you, a uh, likelihood of you having sex with someone if you've known them for X amount of time and you find them attractive. And so on the, uh, the Y axis, it's a plus three. Yes, I jump into bed right away. Minus three is no way. Um, and then on the, um, the X axis is you've known the person five years, two years, six months, one month, an evening, an hour. And the red bar are the males and the blue bar is the uh, females. And as you can see, women kind of bottom out after about a week. Women typically need um, more time, more information. Men never do bottom out. And uh, my uh, former student, David Schmidt, colleague now of eminent professor in his own right, uh, has replicated this now in 50 plus different cultures and we find exactly the same thing. Um, and he's even extended it to, uh, to, to a minute a second and a nanosecond and men never do get extremely negative about this idea of having sex no matter how brief the time or interval is. Uh, this is uh, from a, a graph from, um, oops, I'm sorry, uh, from Dave Frederick that asked about the minimum, ideal and maximum number of casual sex partners that you would ideally like to have, you know, uh, uh, and as you can see the blue bars are men uh, and the red bars are women and desired number of sex partners, a lot higher for men than women, desired number of casual sex partners, a lot higher for men than women. And as you can see, these are not trivial sex differences. So again, desire for sexual variety. <clears throat> now, uh, I mentioned earlier that men are more likely than women to overestimate their mate value. And this is one of the um, kind of hidden findings, but that has occurred, I've tracked the beauty literature over a long period of time. And, and in every third or fourth study, people analyze it like this. Most people don't even report the results. But the fact is that men on average find women to be more attractive than women find men on average. And this is just one data source. This happens to be from OkCupid, but there are other data sources that show this how men rate women, there's kind of a normal distribution. Some uh, are very attractive, some are less attractive, and many in the middle. Uh, but for women, how attractive do women find men? They tend to stack up at the, no, no, does not quite meet my threshold. Uh, not attractive enough. And so there's an on average sex difference such that men find women more attractive than women find, uh, men find women more attractive than women find men. Now, Here's another one, this is, this is from Doug Kenrick, but it's kind of a cool study, is uh, what is the minimum acceptable level of intelligence in a given partner that you would find acceptable, the minimum level in a date, casual sex, steady date, marriage partner. And this illustrates my point that when you're talking about things like marriage, long-term committed pair bonding, both sexes are very choosy. Both sexes say, yeah, partner's gotta be pretty intelligent. But the big sex difference comes in casual sex, where women say, yep, yep, still got to be pretty intelligent for me to have sex with this guy for even a casual hookup. But men say, yep, no, down to the 40th percentile. Uh, you know, they drop their standards, uh, you could say, to embarrassing levels. Um, sexual overperception bias. So this is research spearheaded by uh, Karen Perlow, Dr. Karen Perlow. And this was a very cool study. It was like a, a speed dating study uh, where we brought people into the lab, five men, five women, had them interact with each other uh, and then separate them and say, now, to what degree do you find this person, uh, do you, to, what, to what degree do you think this person is interested in having sex with you? To what degree are you interested in having sex with this person? And what we found is uh, something that is, that is pretty strongly replicable and that is a male over sexual perception bias, such that men erroneously think that, um, that women are more uh, sexually attracted to them than they are. We also found some, um, uh, and this, this can wreak havoc as I'm gonna illustrate with a, a real life example, 
But we also found some unexpected things. We found one unexpected thing is, is that women underestimate how sexually attracted men are to them. And there are different hypotheses about why this might be the case. Uh, perhaps women, uh, are it's a form of deflecting unwanted sexual attention by literally not seeing it. Uh, or men, uh, and it's another hypothesis, these, are, these aren't mutually exclusive, that men intentionally suppress their expression of sexual attraction because a over too early in the interaction expression of sexual interest is actually backfires and um, and turns off women uh, and, and so we found this in other studies that we've done where the the more explicit the sexual attention the um, the least effective the less effective tactic is and so and so it might be that men are not giving women any clues that they're sexually interested or women might be not seeing it you know, as a way of deflecting sexual attention. Those are a couple of hypotheses and, and we haven't tested which of those is, uh, or which combination might be correct and there might be others. Um, now, a second thing that we found is really interesting and it's not gotten sufficient attention, I believe, but I highlighted it in my new book. Um, and that is that it's not all men. Uh, what we found is individual differences in susceptibility to this sexual overperception bias. In particular, men high on narcissism. So this is uh, the narcissism. They they feel uh, that they're the most dazzling, most intelligent, most attractive human being on earth. They they overestimate their mate value, their desirability. They feel entitled to think of a larger share of the pie, whatever that pie may consist of. Um, and men high on the dispositional pursuit of a short-term mating strategy. That is, men who are looking for casual hookups rather than looking to for a long-term uh, pair bonded mateship. These men, this combination is especially vulnerable to the sexual overperception bias. And it's a point I'm gonna come back to. Uh, in another line of studies, we looked at attraction to what we call sexual exploitability cues. And this is a study done with, this is with um, former graduate students, um, now mostly professors, Carrie Getz, Judy Easton and David Lewis, uh, and we assembled photographs, uh, about 100 photographs or so, and we had them rated on um, different um, cues. Uh, and we had things, and I'll give some examples of the cues, and we rated them how easy would it be to uh, seduce this woman? How easy would it be to a separate group of men? How easy would it be to pressure this woman into having sex? How easy would it be to force this woman to have sex? So, uh, attract, and, and how, how attracted are you to these different women at, who display these exploitability cues? Uh, and what we found is that um, there were things that were, some of them were kind of obvious. So if the woman's intoxicated or seems incapacitated, sleepy, gullible, emotionally vulnerable, uh, low cognitive capacity, uh, young or immature, wearing revealing clothing, Lacking bodyguards, and I'm using bodyguards in, a, in the sense of people who are, let's say, friends uh, or male or female friends who look out for their part. You go out to a, a bar or a club or a party uh, or a, a, a frat party. Um, you know, do these women have bodyguards or, or a close kin in proximity? Uh, or do they lack bodyguards? And so these are the cues that men viewed as sexually exploitable and found attractive, okay, but only some men are attracted to sexually exploitable women. And namely men who pursue that short-term mating strategy. Um, so lo long-term maters uh, don't find those cues that attractive. And men high on what are called dark triad traits. These are personality traits of narcissism, Machiavellianism and psychopathy. I've already mentioned narcissism and some of the hallmarks. Uh, Machiavellianism is, uh, are those high scores or those who pursue an interpersonally exploitative social strategy. So these are the cheaters, the liars, the de deceivers, uh, tend to view other people as uh, instrumental pawns to be manipulated for their selfish ends. And then psychopathy, one of the hallmarks of psychopathy is a lack of empathy. So most normal human beings have an empathy circuit, 
when someone gets hurt, a child falls down and skins their knee, a dog gets uh, hit by a car, most people feel a uh, empathy, uh, a, a compassion for the hurt experienced by the victim. Uh, those high in psychopathy do not. They might laugh at when someone else gets hurt or a dog gets hit by a car. So there's a real, these are real, these are real cold hearted dudes. And I say dudes because there are, there's a huge sex difference on that dimension as well. Uh, men score much higher on psychopathy than women. And so it's this combination, short-term mating strategy combined with dark triad traits that are most attracted to the sexually exploitable women. Uh, now, shifting gears slightly. Okay, sexual harassment. Okay, it's a, it's a big issue. It's gotten, it got a lot of attention in the 90s and then kind of faded and it's gotten a lot more attention in, um, since the Me Too movement, hashtag Me Too, uh, with some very high profile cases. Uh, but, we, but I actually started studying this back several decades ago. It was one of the first studies I did on conflict between the sexes. And so here's a question. How harassing is this act? Okay, think about this a thought experiment. You can use your judgment. On a scale of one, it's not harassing at all, to seven, uh, it's extremely sexually harassing. So he stared at her chest while talking to her, asked her if she would take off her clothes, leered at her as she walked by, uh, told her about his sexual exp expertise, told her that if she would sleep with him, he would buy her an expensive gift. Well, what we found several decades ago and now replicated more recently is that, uh, this is with a former graduate student of mine who just got her PhD here, Anna Sedlicek, that <clears throat> women, perceive exactly the same acts as more harassing than men do. And if they, those acts were to happen to them, women would be more upset by men by the same actions. Uh, some men say they would be, wouldn't be upset at all. They would be in fact turned on if a woman did those things uh, to him. So there's an on average sex difference in perceptions of sexual harassment, uh, very important. Now, uh, just to illustrate, this, is, this has real world implications there's a supermarket chain, it's happened to be the Safeway supermarket chain, which is, I don't think there are any Safeways in Texas, but they're, they're, or they're all over the country. Um, and uh, they, they enacted what was called the superior customer service um, uh, form of greeting customers. They instructed their clerks to smile and make eye contact with customers as they help them say check out or help them with other things. This led, this new policy of superior customer service led to requests for dates, sexual propositions, and in some cases, stalking. And women started filing sexual harassment lawsuits um, as a result of this. And so as a consequence uh, of this one policy, they, they eliminated it and it dramatically reduced sexual harassment. So if they had known about this male sexual overperception bias, they could have avoided it to begin with. This is one area where just some, a bit of knowledge about our evolved sexual psychology can uh, lead us uh, away from forms of sexual conflict or help to reduce them. Um, status and sexual entitlement. This is another set of findings. This is uh, John Barge and colleagues found this, is that men high, at high end status and power feel a form of sexual entitlement. Um, and that may be partly why we have seen so many high pro profile cases ranging from uh, Cuomo to Harvey Weinstein, uh, Bill Cosby and, and others, that uh, when men get in a position of power, they feel this sense of entitlement. They also tend to overestimate their attractiveness to women. They tend to feel a lower empathy for their victims. So there's some evidence that uh, higher status men are less empathic. Uh, and uh, Barge found, and, and, uh, and I believe that he's probably correct, and that needs some replication, that there's this unconscious link between power and sex in men's brains, and it's especially true of men high in likelihood of sexual, likelihood to sexually harass. So, and again, here's another theme, which men are serial sexual harassers? And this is where I want to pound home the point that it is not all men. You go into the workplace, you go into the university setting, it's not all or even most guys who are sexually harassers, sexually harassing women. 
there tend to be serial sexual harassers. And often women know this. So a new woman comes in and say, watch, watch out that you're not alone in the Xerox machine, uh, Xerox room with this guy. You know, he has wandering hands. Uh, uh, and, and, so, um, and so it's not that all men are engaging in one or two acts of sexual harassment. It's a small percentage of men who are engaging in the vast majority of acts of sexual harassment. And it's precisely, again, these men who pursue a dispositionally pursue a short-term mating strategy and men who score high in those dark triad traits. They feel entitled, low empathy, and they're interpersonally exploitative. Now, I devote in the, in the new book um, uh, an entire chapter, and I think it's one of the most important chapters of the book. Uh, I devote a chapter to men, the male psychology of sexual uh, perpetration of sexual violence and, and another chapter for women's defenses against sexual violence. And I talk about about a dozen or so defenses that women deploy. Uh, bodyguards, uh, uh, which I've already mentioned briefly, the sexual underperception bias might be one, specialized fears for strength of strange males, uh, alarm calling, screaming, yelling, and so forth. Uh, during uh, rape, and this is something most people don't know about, but there's a, a phenomenon known as tonic immobility where, and it's kind of like freezing, except the body became, the woman's body becomes incapable of, of motion. And it occurs in two specific circumstances uh, in a rape context, sexual assault context, is when the woman feels high levels of fear combined with a high sense of entrapment. That is, she is a trap and there's no, there are no avenues for escape, no bodyguards in close proximity. And the, the body uh, becomes immobile, called tonic immobility, and she's unable to, to fight back. And the reason that this is important is because sometimes women get erroneously blamed for, their, uh, for being sexually assaulted. And people say, well, why didn't you fight back more? Where are your bruises or where are your broken fingernails to show that you fought, fought back? But it's an involuntary response that occurs in between 30 and 40% of rape victims. And sometimes the women themselves feel guilty and blame themselves. They say, why didn't I fight back more? But this is a, it's an involuntary response. And I think knowledge of that and how pervasive it is, I mean, 30 to 40% of victims is not a trivial percentage who experience tonic immobility. It's very important to understand these defenses and to understand which defenses are effective and which are not. And in the book, I summarize the evidence for the effectiveness of these different strategies and, and more that are listed here. And also raise the possibility that what's called PTSD or post-traumatic post stress disorder might not be a disorder. Okay, that is the phenomena might in fact be an adaptation to prevent future episodes of sexual assault. Okay, so to, to, to wrap up here, I wanna offer a couple tentative suggestions for um, uh, reducing sexual conflict. Because I said, that's really my goal is by understanding the psychology of perpetrators and victims, we can better um, uh, be informed to reduce conflict between the sexes. Okay, number one, mind the gap. Uh, that's what they say. And if you go to Britain, the UK, they have in the tube stations, the underground stations, they, they have signs saying mind the gap. They don't mean the sex gap, but they mean the, the, uh, the uh, fissure between the platform and the, and the subway. But I think we have to mind the sex gap. That is that we have to have knowledge about these sex differences in sexual psychology. Men and women in their psychological makeup are by and large the same in many or most domains, but it happens to be in the sexual psychology where the sex differences are most profound and largest in magnitude. Uh, we have to not have knowledge about sexual inferences uh, and sexual emotions. So a modern example of this is that men send unwanted dick pics or sexually explicit images of their genitals to women and when men see uh, decontextualized images of women's breasts or genitals or buttocks, they often find them sexually arousing and they use their own brains to think, well, maybe women will find this arousing as well. They tend not to. Uh, most women say, gross, these are disgusting. I don't like them at all. Um, and men, so there's this gap between 
the sexes in reaction to these sexually explicit images and a gap in inferences about what the other, how the other sex will react to them. Two, sexual harassment codes. Okay, they're almost exclusively written according to what's called the reasonable person standard. Um, now the reasonable person standard uh, is that would a reasonable person find a particular pattern of conduct such as the leering, telling off color jokes, um, you know, unwanted touching, would a reasonable person find this pattern of conduct to be sexually harassing? Well, as it turns out, our studies and others show that it depends on whether you're talking about a reasonable woman or a reasonable man. Uh, and uh, because reasonable men, women and reasonable men differ in what they think constitutes sexual harassment. Uh, and so if the judge happens to be a reasonable man or the jury has a predominance of reasonable men on it, they're gonna to come to very different conclusions in sentencing and judgments than if a woman is the judge or the, the jury consists of a majority of, of women. And so this raises the question, I'm not a legal scholar, but it raises the question, should this reasonable person standard be informed by scientific knowledge that reasonable men and reasonable women differ in their perceptions of sexual harassment. Um, third, uh, recognition of individual differences. And it's not all men, and my book, When Men Behave Badly, is not, uh, it's titled that way in part because it's, it's not all men and it's not all women. There are women who behave badly and I talk about them in the book as well, uh, but it's not all women and it's not all men. And there are what we now know are very predictable individual differences uh, in which men are most likely to inflict these forms of sexual violence on women. Uh, a fourth insight is that mismatches between ancestral and modern environments create some problems while reducing others. So I gave an example early on about how internet dating sites uh, can create uh, problems where none previously existed. They, they, there are uh, forums for new forums for sexual predators um, and, and stalkers in ways that didn't exist in ancestral times of small group living, uh, but also it can reduce some. So women by having say, for example, smartphones uh, have a, a quicker way to uh, alert potential bodyguards that they feel threatened or, uh, or are being uh, attacked or assaulted. And so, and so we have to look at these discrepancies between ancestral and modern environments on a case by case basis. One other discrepancy is that in ancestral environments, humans evolved in the context of small group living where we were surrounded by uh, our genetic relatives, our kin, our family, uh, who were in, in essence functioned as bodyguards who could deter uh, some sexual, potential sexual predators. Now we live in an environment where women go off to college or university, in some cases hundreds or thousands of miles away from their families, uh, away from their friend networks that they had in high school, and are thrown into a, a pool where there are um, uh, unprecedented levels of, of uh, alcohol, uh, uh, novel date rape drugs and so forth, uh, environments where women are not sufficiently prepared for these evolutionarily novel circumstances. So we need to attend to these mismatches between ancestral and modern environments. Um, men and women must join forces and cooperate to reduce sexual violence because it's not, and I hope I, I probably didn't emphasize this enough early in the talk, but that just as there are on average forms of conflict between the sexes, there are also is a high level of cooperation between the sexes. That is every woman uh, has, a, has a father uh, has male friends, often has a brother or brothers uh, who care about them, who care about their welfare. And similarly, every man has a sister, a mother, daughters, female friends that care about them. Uh, and so we are, there, there are large realms of cooperation between some individual men and some individual women, and then certain zones of conflict. And so what we wanna do is ratchet up the cooperative elements in order to reduce the conflictual elements. Uh, and then the final point that I wanna make is that, you, is that 
in some ways we are stuck in the interiors of our own brains because we can't really know for sure what's going on in the minds and brains of other people. And so we, we often use as a default our own sexual psychology to infer the sexual psychology of others. Now, when you're infer if you're a male inferring the sexual psychology of females, you're gonna make some errors. And similarly, if you're a female inferring the sexual psychology of males, you're gonna make some errors. And so my research have gone into it in detail, but uh, that women also make errors they, they, about male sexual psychology. And so I think that education about these very predictable sex differences in sexual psychology can help correct these introspective biases that both sexes have. Uh, and then, so in conclusion, I wanna get back to this key point that sexual violence against women, I think is the most widespread human rights problem in the world. It afflicts, you know, 50% of the population plus, and I think an evolutionary perspective can help us to reduce sexual violence and these other forms of sexual conflict. So thank you very much. If you're interested in more detail about this, I would refer you to my new book, When Men Behave Badly, and then the broader book, The Evolution of Desire, Strategies of Human Mating. So thank you very much and happy to take questions. Thank you so much, David. That was uh, an interesting and informative talk and it stimulated a bunch of discussion in the chat. And I think I'd like to start with the, one of the earlier questions. Um, that we have, what do you think is the source or origin of the overperception bias? And are there cultural differences? Oh, it's a good question. Well, um, the, the, what I think the origin of it is, is, is I actually think that it is a male uh, adaptation uh, to not miss out on any sexual or reproductive opportunities. So that is, if, if um, uh, okay, let me rephrase it this way. This phrase, in, in, according to what we call error management theory, which is a theory that Marty Hazelton and I developed about 20 years ago or so. And basically when you live in an uncertain environment, as I said, you have to make inferences about what's going on in the minds of other people. And if men's inferences were such that they inferred, oh no, no woman is interested in me, I will never, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, the, the classic case of the sexual overperceptive bias is a woman smiles at a man and a man takes the cue and thinks, ah, that's a signal, I'm getting the green light here. Whereas a smile, it's an ambiguous cue. She might be being friendly, she might be being polite, um, she might be feeling anxious because you're creepy and so it's a nervous smile, so, uh, or it could indicate sexual interest. And so in the face of uncertainty and ambiguous cues, men who over inferred sexual interest were more likely to have the confidence to approach women. They were more likely to have the, uh, the uh, yeah, the self-confidence to approach a woman and see whether that interest actually does exist or not whereas men who failed to make that inference would miss out on potential sexual opportunities. The other thing is, uh, I think that um, believing that the woman is sexually interested in you can be, provide that motivational impetus to sometimes transform an initially uninterested woman into an interested one. And so I think it's, it's, it's a male adaptation. And I think that uh, it's a male adaptation that I mentioned that only some men are really vulnerable to that. That is men pursuing the short-term mating strategies. And it's, if, you want to, if, you, if you want to succeed in short-term mating, you don't want to under-infer. You, know, you want to err in the direction of over-inferring to succeed in that short-term mating strategy. So I think it is a male adaptation that is particularly activated in a subset of men. Oh, and cross-culturally, there's been limited cross-cultural research, but the limited research that has been done, uh, for example, in Brazil and a bit in Europe has, has replicated the effect. There were a number of questions about what society can do, what women can do to mind the gap, to teach men how to do a better job at distinguishing um, and recognizing when attraction is happening, when a woman is interested, uh, especially the issue to maybe what do you suggest could benefit young women 
uh, and underage women to do a better job at or, or be part of this minding of the gap? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's, it's a great question and I like the emphasis on young women because as I talk about in the book, uh, young women are um, much more vulnerable uh, to, sex, to different forms of sexual violence. So even in, in college or university, fresh, fresh women, first year women uh, are much more likely to become victimized uh, by sexual violence than sophomores, juniors, or, or seniors. Um, and, uh, and I think that um, the, the points that I ended with are really critical. So one, one is just informing people, why, why, why don't we have courses, even in, in say high school, that teach uh, about relationships and teach about sexuality and teach about the fact that there are sex differences in male and female minds and brains, um, that men are uh, sometimes over and over and for sexual interest when it's not there. Um, that um, and, and that I think knowledge alone won't do won't solve all the problems, but I think it will help. Uh, it will help educate men uh, that women's sexual minds differ from their own and, and help women. Okay, the, the other, in addition to some of the other points like the mismatches and that, and that when young women move away from their families uh, and often don't have sufficient experience in the mating market or mating game, uh, they're more vulnerable to things like alcohol intoxication and, and different forms of sexual violence uh, to cultivate bodyguards. So you can, in a new environment, you can cultivate friends, male friends, female friends, that can basically, just their mere presence deters the different forms of sexual violence. And so I think bodyguards are a very evolutionarily ancient defense that women typically uh, had and used. And in the modern environment, they're sometimes um, absent, but the act of cultivation of these bodyguards, uh, I think is, can be a, a good defense. And then, uh, and then, as I mentioned in, in the book, I talk about uh, other forms of defenses that uh, women you do use and which of, the, which of those are mo most effective in deterring things like a sexual assault. So, so it's a great question. And uh, I, wish, uh, I wish there were courses and I wish they consulted scientists who study this about how to design courses to educate people about these issues. Thank you so much, David. Um, that was very interesting discussion and a talk. Thank you. Um, and uh, good luck everybody in reducing sexual conflict. <laughs> Wish you the best of success in life and mating. So everybody will have a 15 minute break and then come on back to hear our last uh, talk by Dr. Valerie Steele. <laughs>